I think we're going now. All right. No, it's coming now. That's fine. You'll see. You should see it in a. Well, hang on. It's setting it up. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's coming up on my screen. It's streaming live. Right. Okay. Good. Thanks very yeah. much, Rob. Thank you. So apologies um, to those of you who are just joining us for the slight technical issues at the start of today's webinar. We just had a few problems getting the broadcast running, streaming live on YouTube, but it should be there now. And welcome to anyone who is listening there. I'm just admitting the last. Right, Robbie. Sorry, I, I stopped recording because it was recording in case we weren't transmitting, but we're okay now. Sorry, Anna. That's okay. Are you restarting it now? Yeah. Right. Okay. Go. Right, that's brilliant. I'm just letting a few more people into the waiting room, in from the waiting room, and I would like now to welcome you all properly, and we are actually going to start to the Shack webinar today, where I'm delighted to be um, taking over from Frank James as chair and chairing his paper today instead, rather than listening. Um, Frank is going to be talking about trying to return Europe to the Ancien Regime, Humphrey Davy in Naples, chemically recovering ancient literature, 1817 to 1820. Now, before I hand over to Frank, just a few things I'll mention. Um, as hopefully many of you will know, this is um, one in a series of many webinars that Shack have started running over the last few years. Um, our next webinar will take place on Thursday, November the 11th at the same time. And, no. and we'll be featuring Peter Forshaw, who is a Shack Council member, and he will be talking about some of his work on a subject yet to, yet to be confirmed. Um, we also have an in-person meeting coming up in October that will be taking place at UCL on chemistry and archaeology. And actually some of the people on today's call, Umberto Veronese and Frank, will be amongst the speakers there. So, Rob, can you just confirm that everything's all right? Yeah, in terms of IT, that's good. If you're not muted, um, I will have muted you already. And Frank, if you're ready to go, um, I will hand over to you for today's webinar. Hey, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Anna. So I'll start with a poem by William Wordsworth, composed in September uh, 1819 and published the following year. O ye who patiently explore the wreck of Herculaneum lore, what rapture could ye seize? Some Theban fragment or unroll one precious tender-hearted scroll of pure Simonides. That were indeed a genuine birth of poesy, a bursting forth of genius from the dust. What Horace glory to behold, what Morrow loved, shall we enfold? Can haughty time be just? So what uh, Wurzel was talking about was unrolling the literature that was believed to be uh, embodied within these uh, papyri, uh, which had been excavated uh, from Herculaneum, uh, which had been destroyed in uh, 79 AD uh, by Vesuvius, the same volcano that destroyed uh, Pompeii. Um, and in Herculaneum, there was what's now called the Villa de Papari, uh, which was almost certainly owned uh, by Julius Caesar's uh, father-in-law. Uh, and the, ex the uh, excavations uh, commenced in the 1750s found the most wonderful objects, Roman objects, from, uh, from the buried city, including uniquely uh, this library uh, of Papari. Uh, those of you who've may have been to the Archaeological Museum in Naples. We've seen these on display. They are incredibly, incredibly fragile. Just looking at them uh, makes you think that, you, that the, the very act of looking uh, is going to sort of make them uh, disintegrate. And the um, idea was that within these um, scrolls would be the literature, lost literature, or some of the lost literature of an antiquity, the lost works, the lost plays of Euripides, lost works of Aristotle, and so on and so forth. Great excitement uh, throughout the late 18th century about what might be found. And that's expressed uh, in Wordsworth's poem. The, unfortunately, um, this wasn't the case. Uh, most of the papyri that have been unrolled uh, contain uh, work on first century materialism, and in particular, uh, the uh, the uh, writings of Philodemus, um, which are not the most interesting philosophical writings uh, you can uh, imagine. Uh, but work can, work was, but nobody still knew that at the time, and so huge amounts of effort uh, were put in, including uh, in the late 1810s uh, by Humphrey Davy, uh, England's 
uh, leading chemist who was personally commanded uh, by the Prince Regent to go to Naples and help uh, unroll these papyri, because basically uh, the whole process was far too slow uh, so far as uh, the Prince Regent was concerned. Davy had been uh, in uh, southern Italy uh, before uh, on the tour that um, uh, lasted from October 1813 for about uh, a year and a half, um, mostly to observe uh, Vesuvius, and there's no evidence that he was interested at that point uh, in, Hercul in Herculaneum. But he was interested uh, in what could be called uh, conservation science, how one applies chemical knowledge uh, to understanding uh, the uh, heritage objects, the uh, artifacts of antiquity. Uh, so, for example, he and Lady Davy uh, were close friends of Antoine uh, Canova, uh, who was not only one of the leading Italian sculptors of the time, but also commissioned uh, by uh, the uh, uh, Italian uh, governments in Rome uh, to go and recover uh, the work that had been looted uh, by Napoleon's army, armies during the previous uh, 20 years uh, or so. And that was a major part of Canova's task at around this same sort of time, 1816, 1817, following the final defeat of the French military dictator. Um, <clears throat> in Rome, uh, in uh, 1814, uh, Canova pointed Davy to, to uh, buildings like the uh, um, bars of Titus containing uh, these war paintings wanting to analyze and wanted David to analyze what the pigments were um, and also in, uh, in buildings uh, in, in other parts of the uh, bath complex um, and David did that uh, he indeed wrote a whole paper uh, quite a long paper in the philosophical transactions uh, on the chemical compositions uh, of ancient pigments, what ancient blue, what ancient red, what ancient yellow uh, was made of, uh, and so forth. So he already had, uh, two or three years before he was sent to Naples, a strong interest uh, in the sort of chemical, in uses of chemistry for uh, archaeological uh, purposes. And he continued that uh, in, when he got back to England in uh, 18, spring of 1815. Um, he analysed some of the uh, pigments found uh, at Bigner Roman Villa uh, near Arundel uh, in uh, West Sussex, um, which uh, you can see here. I mean, these these are the very earliest examples of uh, buildings designed to uh, preserve and conserve uh, the Roman artifacts uh, below. So, just going back to Herculaneum, uh, this is what Herculaneum looks like uh, today. Like Pompeii has not been fully excavated, and uh, below uh, you have the uh, a drawing, an architectural drawing uh, of the um, uh, Villa de Papari. <clears throat> this villa, by the way, uh, formed the uh, uh, basis on which John Paul Getty uh, had his villa uh, in California designed. John Paul Getty was very, very keen uh, on all things Herculaneum. Um, and it's all, and also, if, if this is owned by Caesar's father-in-law, uh, why, why shouldn't Getty have something similar uh, in uh, California? And as I mentioned earlier, these, these papyri uh, were excavated. Probably about 2,000. It's slightly hard to get a precise number. Uh, because they're so fragile, they were split up into various parts. But well, somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 uh, of these papyri uh, uh, survive. Now, the first approach to unrolling these papyri was mechanical. So this sort of device uh, was built uh, where you attach the uh, papyri by wires to the top of a frame, place the roll uh, in the bottom uh, uh, in a <clears throat> cradle and very, very slowly uh, mechanically unroll. Uh, about a millimeter a day uh, was the typical rate uh, for this uh, in the uh, 18th uh, century. Uh, and it took about 40 years before the first papyri uh, was published by, Phil by Philodemus. The person responsible uh, was Ferdinand IV of the Two Sicilies. Um, 
a Bourbon uh, monarch who had the fortune not only to lose his throne once, but to lose it twice and to be restored uh, by the uh, British uh, on uh, both, both occasions. The first time uh, notorious in a notoriously vicious um, uh, campaign against Jacobin, Napoleon Jacobins, um, which was led on the British side uh, by uh, Lord Nelson. The Neapolitan authorities were, right from the beginning, right from the mid 18th century, were really concerned to keep the intellectual property rights invested in everything coming out of Herculaneum to themselves. So, for example, when visitors went in the late 18th century to visit the archaeological museum, um, which, which at that point was, was actually near Herculaneum itself, uh, they were, their drawing books were confiscated uh, and um, in much the same way as when you go to Downing Street, your mobile phone uh, is, is taken away. And Ferdinand IV does seem to have been sort of fairly happy with the sort of rate um, of progress uh, with, with the unrolling of the, of the papyri because it, because it was one of the, that slowness was one of the ways uh, that kept the intellectual property uh, rights uh, to the Napoleon authorities. Others, others, however, were not that happy. Uh, uh, the Prince of Wales, uh, later Prince Regent, and then George IV, uh, by about 1800, uh, became very, very uh, unhappy at the rate of progress because he wanted uh, the knowledge that was in the papyri uh, to be uh, read, disseminated, published, and made available as all as part of that sort of English classicism uh, that was so dominant uh, in the 18th and uh, uh, and the 19th century, and of course the person he would turn to, the person he turned to first of all was Joseph Banks, President of the Royal Society of London, from 1778 for 42 years, dying in uh, 1820, and um, as part of the um, as part of the gift that uh, Ferdinand IV made uh, to the uh, Prince Regent as a thank you for Nelson uh, getting him restored to the Napoleon throne against the sort of previous Jacobin regime, which only lasted about six months. Um, the King sent uh, uh, Prince of Wales uh, a half a dozen papyri or so, and the Prince Regent commissioned Banks to find a way of unrolling them. And indeed, Banks actually started doing experiments himself. I mean, the idea of banks doing chemical experiments on papyri is, is, is quite interesting one, so completely away from what one normally thinks uh, of banks doing. Now that didn't actually work particularly well, um, and in the end, uh, the uh, Prince of Wales, one of the Prince of Wales's secretaries, Thomas Tuart, uh, took a strong hand and sent uh, John Hayter, a, um, uh, a well-known classicist and uh, a Church of England priest uh, to Naples uh, to speed up uh, the process. I don't have photo I don't have images of either of those. Um, I'm afraid to say I haven't been able to find any. So if anybody knows of images of either hate or to it, uh, I would be uh, extremely grateful. Hater um, sped things up. Uh, he's again he sort of pursued a mechanical way of unrolling, but sort of got about sort of half a dozen frames with sort of 13, 15. Uh, operators and did actually speed up uh, the process of, of unrolling. And this is a list uh, of, of part of a one page or four page list uh, of the uh, papyri which Peter had uh, unrolled up until uh, towards the end of 1805. And the reason why uh, is, a, is an image of um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, well known poet and philosopher, is for a while uh, in 1804, 1805, uh, he was secretary to the government of Malta, which had just uh, been uh, taken over by the uh, British as a major strategic base uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean. And this is the list uh, that Coleridge of, of Papawai that Coleridge uh, was bringing back uh, from Malta, visiting Hayter uh, in uh, Naples. Um, now, unfortunately, this list is still in the Coleridge papers in the University of Toronto, so one has to assume that 
courage in a sort of typical courage and fashion uh, did not deliver uh, this document uh, to the government uh, but there's another there's another copy uh, that was delivered uh, to to the government um, and uh, one can see that the number of papawai that uh, Hayter was responsible for was is quite a large number. Um, the, had, they had an excellent numbering system. Every every papawai that was excavated had a number, and that you can see in left hand uh, column uh, on on each each of the columns. But as you can also see, um, most of the entries are fragmenty fragments, uh, and we really don't uh, know how long those some of those fragments. Uh, were because one has to say in the final analysis a lot of this was actually pretty destructive uh, of the texts uh, which is not um, not helpful. Something went wrong with Hater at some point um, after about sort of um, eight years uh, in office. The um, and this comes crystal clear. Uh, in a letter that the British ambassador to Naples, William Drummond, wrote to Hayter in mid-December 1808. A letter of remonstration on the boils, quarrels and riots occasioned by persons living in my house, the stories of your battles and brothels, and so, etc. So, so made much noise and were multiplied so fast that I found it impossible to apologise uh, for your conduct. And as a result, uh, Hayter... Um, was recalled to London and he um, went voluntarily, although one has to say the Prince of Wales actually sent a King's messenger, no less, to Naples uh, to bring him back. When he got back in 1809, he there was then a political cover-up, uh, hiding all this sort of extraordinary, rowdy, debauched, uh, what you will, uh, behavior. Uh, he was uh, given a new living in Suffolk as an Anglican priest. This is an Anglican priest we're talking about, remember, uh, and uh, was gazetted as the curator of the Prince's Herculaneum uh, Papawa as, as an official title. Well, the war dragged on for the next few years. Nothing much happens to the Papawa. Um, the um, French invaded Naples yet again, occupied it, um, and Ferdinand IV was forced to go to uh, Sicily, uh, where he spent the remainder of the war. And when he was restored again by the British uh, in 1815, um, uh, he gave, again, a set of papawai uh, to what was now the Prince Regent um, uh, as a token of thanks for the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. Uh, in uh, in Naples, and in in exchange, the Prince Regent, uh, I mean, the, the King gave gave uh, twelve papawai, and in exchange, the King uh, gave uh, sorry, the Prince Regent gave the King five kangaroos, um, which is interesting. Which is an interesting rate of exchange. Uh, these kangaroos certainly arrived in Naples. They were kept in the Royal Menagerie at uh, Casata, which is one of the big Royal, Bourbon Royal Palaces. And I have to say, I did, did, did I, when I first came across this story, I had hoped that these kangaroos would be hopping around the base of Vesuvius, but uh, nothing so so exciting. A, a, a very high-powered committee was set up by the Prince Regent, including people like the, the Speaker, um, the... Um, uh, Lord Aberdeen um, and uh, others, Charles Burney and Humphrey Davy, uh, to try and find a way uh, of unrolling these half these dozen papyri uh, that had arrived uh, in London. The first thing they tried was employing the services uh, of Friedrich Sickler, uh, a Saxon um, uh, chemist uh, who was able to persuade Turret that he'd actually found a way of chemically unrolling them by dipping the papawai uh, in an unspecified uh, chemical mixture. Um, and Sickler was paid a really large amount of money, I mean, about 1,500 pounds in total. I mean, that's, that's a huge amount of money uh, to come to London uh, to continue work uh, on the papawai. That did not succeed. Uh, Davy wasn't involved at that point, uh, and poss possibly strategically he went on a tour uh, of the 
north of England and Scotland uh, at that point. So that by the time he returned, Sickler was thoroughly discredited, uh, generally regarded as a charlatan uh, and was sent packing uh, back to Saxony. Um, Davies' view on sort of chemical unrolling was actually, yes, if you had the right chemicals, you could do this uh, Sickler because of his secrecy and nobody knew what, what he was actually putting the papara in. Um, uh, it, was, it was clearly unreliable. Uh, and this resulted in Davy doing some work on, on some of the remaining papyri, uh, which showed potentially positive results of being able to unroll the papyri and read their contents. And on this basis, in 1818, uh, the, Davey, um, the Prince Regent held an audience with Davy and commanded him uh, to go to Italy, uh, go to Naples, and start unrolling these papyri using his chemical uh, techniques and confirming that that chemical technique uh, worked. And this is precisely what um, uh, Davy uh, did. And in a letter uh, to his erstwhile assistant at the Royal Institution, Michael Faraday, uh, Davy uh, describes his technique that he refined while he was in Naples. I find that by raising to heat very slowly, i.e. taking five or six hours to raise it to 600 degrees Fahrenheit, the separation Frank, you accidentally muted yourself. Frank. Okay, I don't know how that happened. No, sorry. <laughs> Where did I um, get to before I before I? Uh, it's, it's only been a matter of sort of a sentence or so. Um, right, okay. Sorry about that. I didn't press anything at all. I, I, don't, I don't know what happened there. Gone back to the beginning. Uh, no, I've gone back to the start. Sorry. No, no. I'm afraid it was me. Oh, it's Rob. He's he's admitting now. Okay. Right, I showed this quotation to one of um, England's leader, leading paper conservators um, uh, today, and he, he turned a sort of slightly peculiar shade of grey uh, when, when, he, when he saw it, um, which I took to mean that he wasn't hugely impressed with Davies, uh, Davies techniques. Uh, the result of this early work in, in Naples uh, was a paper published in the Quarterly Journal of Science, edited by William Thomas Brand from the Royal Institution, uh, uh, on the Davies' report to the government um, about what to do with the papyri. Um, the, the sort of notion of secrecy um, still existed, uh, even as late as uh, 1819, when this was published. Uh, because Davy was very, very angry indeed that this this report had been published. It was, um, and he even wrote to Faraday saying, "If it's if it hasn't been published, could you please not publish it?" By that by that by that point, uh, it had been uh, published, and it's on this basis of this paper uh, that Wordsworth uh, wrote his poem uh, in September uh, uh, eighteen nineteen. As with scientific research then and now, um, Davy's recommendation. Was to have was to do more research, get into place the sort of skills required to work on the manuscripts. Apart from his, in addition to his own uh, chemical chemical skills, and to this end, uh, he persuaded the government to pay the British government to pay uh, two men to come out uh, and work on them. Now, the first was William Gale, an extremely well known. Um, uh, artist and archaeologist who was normally based uh, in uh, Naples. Uh, he spent most of his most of his life there. Um, he was a confidant of uh, Queen Caroline, and I can only assume that the Prince Regent did did not know that at that point, because had the Prince Regent known that he was a friend of the, uh, uh, well, she was then Princess Caroline. Uh, there was absolutely no way he was going to sort of support uh, an involvement of Gale. Uh, the other person um, uh, that Davy got out from Italy, to Italy from Oxford, uh, was Peter Elmsley, a really prominent classicist 
uh, described by his friend Robert Southey as the fattest undergraduate in, in, in his year uh, when he was at Oxford. And so the idea was that Davy uh, supervising the uh, unrollers in Naples would unroll the papyri. Gale would then make images of the papyri, the so-called designee, uh, because even with the greatest care, the, this, the rate of destruction doing those using that sort of chemical means was really quite high. And Elmsey would then read the Greek or the occasional Latin uh, of the papyri and reveal all these wonderful texts uh, that they were expecting uh, to find. Now, what happened is not entirely clear, um, but it probably linked to the Napolitans' ideas of having of owning intellectual property, because everybody blamed Elmsley. Davy blamed Elmsley. The, the Napolitan government blamed Elmsley um, for uh, trying to sort of take the intellectual property uh, away uh, from Naples. And at the end of February uh, 1820 both Elmsley and Davy simply left uh, Naples uh, without explanation um, because they were, they, they just got so, they were clearly so angry uh, with what the Neapolitan authorities uh, were doing to them. Gale's illustrations um, are an uh, example here. Uh, he made a whole series of these sorts of illustrations, really wonderful drawings, as you would expect from Gerald, and these are in a volume of uh, um, drawings related to papyri, which are now in the World Collections at Windsor. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, and which Davy presented uh, to the now king, George the uh, George IV. And again, one assumes the king did not know particularly of Gerald, Gerald's, Gerald's um, connection with um, uh, Queen Caroline and the famous divorce and coronation incident where the queen was locked outside uh, Westminster uh, Abbey while the king was being crowned. Um, one assumes the next coronation will not uh, be, so, be so spectacularly interesting as that. So this is the sort of thing that Davy was working on. This is this is a this is on the right is an image of the um, uh, text that Davy could get out uh, from unrolling a papyri, such as the one uh, you see on the left. And people like Elmsley, by mean by sort of philological means, I've got no idea how he would do it. I was able to create uh, the complete text uh, out of these. Uh, sorts of uh, fragments. Elmsley, as I said, left and went to Florence. Davy made his way um, slowly back uh, to uh, England. Now, a deeply suspicious mind, uh, such as mine, I suppose, would wonder whether Davy, by February 1820, had heard a rumour that Banks was dying in London. Uh, if he had, uh, that would explain his rather imperious uh, decision just to leave Naples um, and return to London, because Davy, more than anything else, wanted to succeed Banks as president of the Royal Society of London, and um, which he duly did. Uh, and you can see uh, Davy as president uh, with the mace, uh, sitting in the presidential chair uh, of the Royal Society uh, of London. I suppose the major question that sort of rises out of this story is why were so many really important and busy people, particularly in, in, this, in the stressful time of war, global warfare, so concerned uh, with these papyri? And my answer to that particularly in the light of um, recent events, is that when, you're, when you are fighting a global war, um, a, a sort of ideological uh, war um, between Britain and France and their respective allies, suddenly cultural objects uh, become worth fighting for. 
um, they they represent they somehow symbolically uh, represent uh, part of the causes of the war. Why is why the war's worth uh, fighting, worth spe spending so much uh, time on? And one, one, one sees this. Uh, one still, we see, we see this now in the Ukraine. One thinks of the Scythian um, gold that um, has sort of somehow vanished, hopefully not into Russia. Uh, and one thinks of the wanton destruction uh, by ISIS uh, of um, uh, pre Islamic monuments uh, in Syria. So I think, the, I think at times of that sort of global or even specifically local stress in terms of war, preserving your culture uh, is worthwhile. And I think that is why so many people uh, uh, from heads of state downwards, and I haven't had time to talk about the influence of all the politicians, I mean, people like Castlereagh and Liverpool uh, turn up uh, in this story. I think that is why for some sort of sake of a European classical identity, uh, this became such an important episode uh, in the story. So that's the end of that, I, but I just want to sort of give a quick plug uh, to the Davy Notebooks uh, project, um, which I'm a co-I, run out of the University of Lancaster, um, and it's a, it's a crowd collaborative effort through Zooniverse, uh, and if you'd like to come and help transcribe uh, Davy's 75 notebooks, uh, please go to the sort of link below or just type in um, Google uh, Davies, Davies Notebooks and you'll be able to join up. We're about two thirds of the way through uh, transcribing the notebooks. And with that, I shall try and return to some sort of normal screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for that brilliant webinar and for bearing with the few challenges that Zoom is hosting on us today. Um, we were, Frank's very happy to take questions. Um, you can either ask them in chat or let us know through chat that you want to ask a question and um, we can, we can, you can speak to Frank directly. Um, as nothing's come up in chat yet, I might ask, take the chair's prerogative and ask a question first. I was just wondering, Frank, about what sort of happened afterwards, whether the techniques involved in this work had use afterwards. Obviously, it was a big political dimension to what you've been talking about, but... Did that sort of fizzle out at the end of the sort of tumultuous period you're talking about, or did it have use in other applications? Well, the, um, the short answer is no. Um, after the presentation of that volume of manuscript drawings um, to the king, there's, I've not found any evidence the king continued with any interest. Because the war's over, it's five, it's, it's five years after the end of the war. The king's got other, other problems, not least his queen. Um, and that sort of stress no longer is, is no longer driving it. And I think the other issue is because they keep on discovering all they find is Philodemus at best, first century materialism uh, at worst. I mean, just people, people think this is just tedious. Uh, and there's, there's sort of intellectually, there's so sort of little incentive uh, to follow through. And indeed, it's not until the 1840s uh, that a serious program uh, of um, uh, unrolling the papyri begin, begins again. And the interesting thing there is that Justus von Liebig uh, is involved in that, though I've not actually sort of looked at that. I do also have to say this, this project is continuing. I mean, 250 years after these papyri were excavated and put in the, into the museum, uh, there's still a lot of work going on. There are, sort of, there are groups in, in Naples, obviously, uh, uh, in... Um, the Bodleian uh, and in Bergen. Uh, there's, a, there's a good reason, I was told there was a good reason why it's in Bergen, but I can't remember what it is now. Um, uh, but instead of physically or chemically unrolling them, they use uh, uh, tomography. And so basically the idea is that it's at certain wavelengths, uh, the ink of the papyri fluoresce at a different rate uh, to the surrounding papyri and you, you can, Sort of measure that and then computationally reconstruct uh, the flat text uh, from the uh, uh, rather charred uh, papyri. And um, they're still finding Philodemus, I'm afraid to say. I should also say that about, only about half of the villa de papyri has been, um, has been excavated. Um, and there's a big arguments about whether that sort of excavation 
um, uh, should resume or not. Uh, so this is, this is not a story that's um, going to go away any anytime soon. Thanks, Frank. Has anyone got any questions for Frank? The um, chat is quite quiet at the moment. If anyone just wants to put their hand up on Zoom or... Um... Gosh. I know. You've summed everyone into silence, Frank. <laughs> That's interesting, but not a question. No, no. Yes. Hello to Malika. I do remember you from when you were working at the Wellcome Trust History of Medicine Library back in 2011. Mate, you, you, oh, Rosie's put her hand up. Rosie, do you want to unmute yourself and ask Frank your question? I hope I've got your name right, Rosie. Bex, it's Bex. Oh, Bex, sorry, Bex, sorry. Oh, yeah, hi. Um, so I wanted to know, Frank, it, as you've followed this journey of the uh, papyri, um, was any of the work done by, um, what was his name, uh, by Davy and Elmstree? El Elmsley? Elmsley. And Elmsley. Elmsley. Did any of that initial work and theory into how to unfurl and how to get the information from the papyri actually inform uh, the way, as this is an ongoing project, the science and the investigation developed to contemporary time? Like, do, do, do any, does, is there any sort of reference back to the work that was tried back then now well, or anything that came after? Yes, there is, but it's, it's, a, very, it's a very curious form of reference. So in the, um, li the papyri literature, um, I mean, Papyrology is a smaller discipline than the history of science, which is sort of pushing it a bit. Um, the papyrological literature is very familiar with the work of all these people, but in a really strange way, uh, because what they do is to say, is to make lists of papyri and say, these papyri were, sort of, was work, were worked on by Davy or by Elmsley or by, uh, or Sickler or whoever. Um, and mostly sort of no longer exist follows, which is why the designee are so important as they're the only surviving records of some of these papyri. Um, but one of the reasons why I started on this paper was, yes, okay, so it's quite interesting to know which, which particular papyri Davy worked on. It doesn't actually tell you a huge amount, uh, well, it doesn't tell you anything actually, about why they were working um, on these papyri and spending so much time, effort, resource at very high levels in both politics um, and and science. So at one level, yes, they are aware of that, but at another level, they use it in a sort of really strange, well, from a historical point of view, uh, strange way. I mean, it's more philological than anything anything else. Well, given so, the long, sorry. Sorry, I'm here. Uh, so like given the longevity of the project, there were no other instances um, by which these papyri became politically salient at all or received the same well, amount of attention since? I haven't, I mean, I can't categorically say that's the case, but that's, that's my impression, I have to, I have to say. Um, uh, it's much more an academic exercise funded through normal academic channels rather than through the royal families of... Um, uh, Hanoverian London and Bourbon, Bourbon Naples. Uh, so Malik has asked, can you please elaborate on the socio-political condition during Humphrey Davies' time? Um, well, Dave was born in 1778 when Britain was fighting a war against France and later on other countries over their support for all the uh, rebels in North America, um, and there was sort of a relatively a relative period of peace um, for about ten years following 1783, uh, and then the French Revolution 1789 led to the sort of twenty year, more than twenty years of war, continuous global warfare, uh, and that's the context in which Davy uh, did. Uh, most of his work. 
Uh, Davy as a young man does seem to have had Jacobin um, uh, materialist sympathies, particularly when he was in Bristol working with Thomas Beddoes, a well-known Jacobin materialist. Uh, but he, um, uh, but when he got to the Royal Institution, run uh, run by one Joseph Banks, will be behind the scenes, um, telling your audience that um, they shouldn't really be in power. Uh, Jacobin was not going to go down too well, um, and so um, uh, Davy's rhetoric changed rapidly, and you start getting references to the Creator, the Supreme Being, uh, which suggests uh, Davy's sort of Masonic uh, uh, leanings, um, and that continues all the way through to 1815. After which, the continent becomes open again and so the Prince Regent can send Davy off to Naples to do this sort of work. I mean what I think also I, I should comment that Na as I said Ferdinand the Fourth was restored twice by the British um, and that disparity of power gives you an indication of um, Britain's view of Naples. It wasn't unlike Malta which was became a colony um, it, Southern Italy sort of was within the British sphere of influence, but never formally run by Britain. Though there was a, there was a, there was a, there was an idea at one point to take over Sicily, uh, because Sicily has lots of sulphur, and sulphur is a very, very strategic uh, material. But I think in the end, the British decided trying to run Sicily with all those Sicilians was not not a good idea. Um, John's and Christie's got a question for you, Frank. Do you want to unmute yourself, John? Yes. Can you hear me, Anna? Yes, we can, John. OK, uh, thanks very much indeed. Uh, I wanted to pursue um, the Philodemus, is it? And, and, and you call it materialism. Is it possible to say a bit more about what kind of materialism it is? Is it a kind of, uh, I don't know, a, a late classical Epicurean kind of a thing uh, or what? I'm just thinking about the contemporary context, say, of the 1810s in London, and also, um, at least in British eyes, uh, in France as well, um, where many uh, uh, French savants are regarded as arrant materialists. Um, and the kinds of materialism that you can find in London scientific communities in the 1810s and 1820s, uh, that has become quite well explored. So, so uh, if you move from there, where materialism is actually quite interesting, and there seems to be quite a lot of it, uh, uh, why is the press region and everyone up at the level that you've been looking at, why is it just sort of dull and boring and they can't be that bothered with it? Well, I think the answer to that um, is that, as you quite rightly say, uh, materialism in the early 19th century was viewed with, by deep, deep suspicion by the by the ruling class. I mean, that's I mean, that's what, that's why I said just now, um, Davy had to shift his position quite noticeably from, from when he was in Bristol uh, working with Thomas Beddoes, who was an avowed Jacobin albeit a Jacobin who didn't like Robespierre, which is an interesting idea, um, uh, to being someone who takes a sort of natural theological, natural philosophical uh, view uh, of chemical phenomena um, and with a sort of very strong utilitarian usefulness um, uh, basis behind it, though I wouldn't overemphasize that. I mean, there, there was great disappointment. I mean, without a shadow of doubt, there was great disappointment. Uh, as but, but just because it's uh, just because it's uninteresting, or perhaps they found it would, it, would, it, would it have been regarded as dangerous? Um, that I've never I've never seen anybody. The, the worst I've seen is Charles Blagden in his diary referring. Mm. Or, no, it's actually a letter to the banks. Uh, actually referring to when he's when Blagden's in Naples, uh, referring to the referring to Philodemus as that wordsmith. Uh, who says you've got, to do, you've got to do lots of examples in order to find things out. I mean, it's completely contemptuous um, uh, of, um, 
uh, of Philodemus. And but that's a fair, that's that's pretty unusual. I can't think of anything else where mm-hmm. it's so dismissive. You just you just get this sense. Why the hell didn't Julius Caesar's father-in-law have <laughs> Aristotle or Euripides or Euclid? Um, and just all this sort of stuff. I mean, it does tell it tells you an awful lot about what upper upper. Yeah. Well, I mean, really upper class people in the first century uh, thought was Im- important in philosophical terms. And you're absolutely right, John. Um, it it is closely related to um, Epicurus and Lucretius. Uh, mm-hmm. There are actually one or two paragraphs of Lucretius that pop up from time to time, which which people do find interesting because Lucretius is regarded as interesting. I mean, it's mm-hmm. sort of it's just Philodemus uh, just seems just seems to be he's regarded as he's he's regarded as uninteresting. What I don't know because I'm not not a specialist in sort of these sorts of ancient Greek texts um, is how he was actually regarded in Roman mm-hmm. times. Um, but presumably because there's so much of him, uh, he was highly regarded by the Caesar family, but nobody else. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, uh, Frank. That has clarified things quite a lot for me. Thanks. Most interesting. Thanks. Has anyone else got any questions for Frank? Um, either put them in chat or we can go to you if you want to raise your hand. Whilst you, um, whilst you might be thinking about questions, I will just mention again the next SHAC meeting, which is actually taking place in person at UCL on the 22nd of October. It's on archaeology, conservation science and the history of chemistry. And Frank is one of the speakers that day as well, so it may well be of interest to you. And we've also got Viva Bernstock and Umberto Veronese amongst the speakers. Um, we will be sending round details to SHAC members soon, and they'll also be on Mersenne and Chemhist and the usual places. Yes, it's not it's not entirely coincidental that um, we're having that particular day because it's that sort of it's sort of a, gen, a more a generalization of the sort of interest I've I've expressed um, working on the Herculaneum papyri and when you start looking around there's actually quite a lot of uh, these kind of um, projects they're nothing that lasts for 250 years which is which I have to say I find quite quite impressive. And we should also mention in relation to that as well, Frank, there's a special edited um, collection, special collection of Andix at the moment, which is online. I will find the link and put it in um, chat in a minute. Um, basically, Umberto has edited that and it brings together various papers on conservation science that have been published in Ambix over the years. And it is accessible, free free access so you, um, until the end of November, I think, isn't it, Frank? Yes, right, yeah, yeah. That's what we got, yeah. Yeah. So... Is there anything else you want to add, Frank? Um, no, I hope, look forward to seeing you at UCL um, in a month or so's time, well, less than a month's time now. Well, thank you all very much for joining us today. It's been lovely to have you with us this afternoon. Um, don't forget that in a month's time, we'll be having Peter Forshaw's um, webinar on the 7th, on Thursday, the 17th of November at the same time. Again, details will go around to chat members and you'll see it advertised on Mercent and Chem Hist and you can sign up via Brentbright. So if we can just give a virtual round of applause to Frank, Frank to thank him very much for his contribution today. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And I can see lots of thank you messages in chat, Frank, and virtual claps as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us. And if you want to see any previous Shack webinars, you can find them on our Shack YouTube channel as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna.